Ethan Bronner is the deputy foreign editor of the New York Times, a position from, uh, to which he was recently appointed. Prior to that, Mr. Bronner was named assistant editorial page editor of the New York Times in January 2002, where he focused on foreign affairs, the law, and education. Throughout the previous fall, he worked as an editor in the paper's investigative unit, focusing on the attacks of September 11th. A series of articles on Al-Qaeda that Mr. Bronner helped edit during this time was awarded the 2001 Pulitzer Prize for explanatory journalism. He had, he had been the paper's education that occurred from 1999 to 2001 and a national education correspondent from 1997 to 1999. Before joining the Times, Mr. Bronner was with the Boston Globe from 1985 until 1997, where he started, where he started on general assignment and then covered urban affairs. He went on to become a Supreme Court and legal affairs correspondent in Washington, D.C., and a Middle East correspondent based in Jerusalem. He began his journalistic career at Reuters in September 1980 and reported from Jerusalem, London, Madrid, and Brussels. Mr. Bronner an author of, is the author of Battle for Justice, How the Bork Nomination Shook America, which was chosen by the New York Public Library as one of the 25 best books of 1989. Mr. Bronner received a BA in letters from West Wesleyan University and an MS from Columbia University School of Journalism. He is on the Board of Direct Trustees of Wesleyan and a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. He was born on November 26, 1954, is married, and has two children. Please join with me in welcoming Mr. Ethan Bronner. Thank you very much. It's a very kind introduction. <clears throat> It's uh, great to be here. I uh, came skiing and now I came to talk and I couldn't be happier. So it's, uh, and I can't believe it's 50 degrees and you look at these snow peak mountains all day. It's a very beautiful place. You're lucky to be here. Um, I, I think we have about an hour and I'll, I'll try to talk for about half of it and then ask you guys to uh, talk to me, ask questions. Uh, we can take it in a variety of directions. Um, I wanted to start talking about the issues of covering the Middle East, particularly ethical and professional dilemmas that uh, you face when you do it, because I did it for eight years and now I, um, I help manage people to do it. Um, and it, it's an interesting set of problems. But I'm also, um, as was mentioned, I was on the editorial page for two years, and I want to talk a little bit also about the difference between um, being a, a straight newspaper editor and writer and uh, uh, writing opinions for the opinion page. There are ethical dilemmas that you face no matter what you cover if you're a journalist. If you cover City Hall or if you cover Liberia, uh, it, it isn't just in the Middle East. Uh, and the issues are typically the same, which is that you uh, uh, constantly have to make short-term, medium-term, and long-term decisions. And you also have to kind of figure out the relationship between access uh, and truth. So that when you, uh, uh, when you get access to a source, an official of some kind, and the person gives you something and then asks you not to print it, you've got to figure out what to do about that, whether to keep the source or use the information. That's the sort of thing that happens all the time at, in, in spades in, in the Middle East. You may have heard of uh, the uh, CNN executive named Eason Jordan. He's been in the news again in the last couple of weeks because he just uh, quit um, over a controversy in which he was said to have said in Davos uh, in January that the uh, US military had targeted American, or anyway, journalists, I'm not sure he said American, um, in Iraq. And then he said he didn't really mean to say that. And in any case, he had been under fire for this other thing that I want to talk about. And uh, I think his uh, own personal career and personal life were in mid-transition, and he stepped down. But um, I want to talk about something he wrote a couple of years ago for the New York Times op-ed page. Um, in which he found himself in hot water. He, at that time, you may recall, <clears throat> even if you don't read the Times every day, you may have heard about it. It was right after Saddam Hussein was toppled, so that would have been April of uh, 2003. Um, and he wrote an op-ed in which he said, you know, now that Saddam Hussein is gone, he, as the senior executive for news at CNN, has some things he wants to tell us, uh, things that he couldn't, that the organization couldn't say uh, while, they, while Saddam was still in power. Uh, he said because if he had said these things, it would have endangered the lives of, um, of their Iraqi employees in, in Baghdad. 
Here were some of the things that he mentioned in his op-ed piece. He said that a CNN cameraman was tortured by government thugs, that Uday Hussein, the dictator's son, uh, told Issa and Jordan that he intended to murder two brothers-in-law and King Hussein of Jordan, and an aide to Uday said that his front teeth had been yanked out by pliers by Uday's henchmen, who told him not to wear dentures so that he would remember never to upset his boss again. Jordan wrote in his op-ed piece that to have reported any of this in real time <clears throat> would have endangered his local employees, as I said, and their families. What, what emerged is a flood of letters to the Times, as well as uh, sort of, you know, the 24-hour talk radio, uh, uh, Fox News, CNN News uh, situation, where there was a sort of kind of explosion of discussion, particularly from conservatives who have their issues with mainstream media to begin with. Who, who saw a way in to attack Eastern Jordan and who said uh, if CNN were an honest news organization, it would have simply closed its bureau and then reported the truth. Moreover, they said CNN's decision to keep a presence in Baghdad had less to do with concern for Iraqis or journalism than with money, that it had its eye on ratings. CNN was the only organization allowed to operate in Iraq. And you may recall, uh, in addition, that uh, during the first uh, U.S.-led invasion uh, of Kuwait to drive Hussein's troops out of, uh, out of, out of uh, Kuwait, that CNN was also the only news organization that was permitted to operate for a while. So there was a sort of history, and there was a sense that, uh, that CNN had compromised itself unduly in order to maintain access. Now, I have to tell you that as I read his op-ed piece, I, I can't say that Eastern Jordan's uh, article inspired confidence, uh, but I did feel uh, that to judge it, you really needed to look at, say, the last 10 or 12 years of CNN's coverage and to figure out whether, on balance, CNN had reported truthfully from Iraq, given a true picture of life there, or whether they so often and so uh, poorly shaded facts that to make, to make the coverage a kind of violation of what we like to think of as the public trust of journalism. And the two sides would call, offer quotes uh, that either damned or redeemed the coverage, but my sense was that you could really only tell the answer by, by studying the videotapes, go to the videotapes. Um, but nonetheless, I felt that the controversy really did uh, highlight an uncomfortable reality that we don't often talk about, and that is that to cover a totalitarian state like the Iraq of Saddam Hussein, it forces the journalists into compromising ways. If you've ever reported or know anyone who's reported from countries like that, you know that it is one of the biggest challenges you face. You have a sort of daily, almost hourly calculation over access, uh, honesty, freedom of movement, and fear of reprisal. Some governments assume that a foreign journalist is a spy, and the way they treat you often forces you to act like one. In the Middle East, this is particularly true for reporters. If you just to get a visa to a place like Iran, Syria, Sudan, Libya, is a monumentally frustrating chore. But we at the Times have not had uh, a proper visa to Iran for 18 months. A few countries' applications, for example, demand to know if you have ever visited occupied Palestine, and by that they mean Israel. And if you say yes, you may well be barred from getting the visa, uh, since any decent reporter who covers the Middle East has at least visited Israel, essentially being asked to lie and then you have to weigh whether you want to do that. A few countries on their visa applications ask your religion. Jewish is not the right answer. <laughs> Often, a visa is available only during a state of a sort of staged celebration. Saddam used to throw um, these extraordinary birthday parties for himself every April. Uh, and you would be able to come in and um, chronicle you know, all the poetry that had been written on that day uh, for the great leader. Um, but once you get inside, you still face enormous barriers. You can, for example, spend months applying for a visa to Syria. Syria is changing a little, but nonetheless, or Iran, and never be granted an interview by a single officer or official. I mean, higher than the deputy minister of information or the minister of information. If you're a television, and even if you're print, you can find yourself assigned a minder, someone who goes with you wherever you go for your interviews, and obviously, that can sort of stymie honest conversation. Um, people may be delighted to meet you as an American. I mean, the Arab world is an extremely welcoming place, one of the most hospitable societies in the world. 
uh, but when they find out that you're a journalist, uh, they may turn away from you in fear, not in hostility. And in addition, and this is the more subtle point, but I think an equally important one, controlled societies really don't offer people who live there a language, a means to think about dissent or to think about life as it might be lived in a different way. And then finally, what you write might determine whether you get a visa next time. Well, in the Middle East, one solution, of course, is to go to the place where the story is most accessible, and typically that means Israel. But I can assure you that those who were complaining about CNN generally would certainly complain more if it and other news organizations produced even more stories about Israel and still fewer stories about the countries around it. Uh, there's a terrible imbalance of coverage in the region in exactly that way. I never faced uh, the sense that I was um, uh, placing an employee's life in danger the way Eastern Jordan did, but I did struggle with these dilemmas. Uh, and I'll give you a, a, a somewhat trivial example, but nonetheless, I think a telling one. And that was in the mid 90s when I was in Syria. I uh, heard from several people that uh, then President Assad, who's now died, uh, daughter Bushra uh, was in love with and wanted to marry, in fact, had married a politically ambitious officer, uh, and that uh, this was something that her father had opposed, um, and that and her brother, um, Basil, had opposed. This is a brother who subsequently died in a car accident. Um, sorry, who died in a car accident just before she got married, uh, and that's why she was able to get married. So uh, it was. this is something that had never been in the Syrian press, not been on television, no one talked about it. Um, but. I knew it was true because the three people I heard from all had access to real information. One of them was the landlord of the couple, as it happened. So I wrote this story, not a very big story, simply saying, you know, that uh, um, President Assad may rule his country with an iron fist, but his daughter was able to get her way. And um, the next time, and I was working for the Boston Globe at the time, and it appeared on, you know, page D406, right? It wasn't a big story from anyone's perspective. Um, but the next time I applied for a visa to, uh, to Syria by phone, the way you do it is you call the information ministry and tell them that you're applying. Um, the guy on the other end just screamed at me uh, nonstop for about five minutes and said that no one had ever mistreated the, the president's family the way I had and uh, shown this kind of disrespect. I asked him if, if he, the story wasn't true. He said that that wasn't the point. Um, but that um, uh, and they were not going to let me in. That this was no way for me to be writing about the president. That the Syrian press wouldn't do so, and I shouldn't do so. So I uh, didn't get back into Syria for another year and a half. Um, and I uh, and I I, I ask myself, and I ask you, did I make the right decision to write the story? Because um, I'm really not sure. I, I mean, I did tell my readers something that they didn't know, and something that was interesting but at what cost to my broader coverage of the country and of the region, if I had saved, perhaps, that story uh, for a larger story and waited for another time to inject it into the story, might I have gained more information about Syria in subsequent visits that I couldn't make? And on the other hand, if I hadn't published the story, wouldn't I have been betraying my readers uh, and my mission by withholding information that I had? Because, again, keeping the Eastern Jordan story in mind, the truth is that every time I visited Syria or Iraq or Iran or any of those countries that are hard to get into, I learned a lot. And I believe that my readers benefited either from the articles I wrote from those places or broader pieces that I wrote from the region as a whole. And I was often able to move around without a minder at every moment because they care less about medium-sized American newspapers than they care about networks. But I can tell you that there's just no way to understand a place if you haven't set foot in it. And yet, by going there, you're forced to contend with a set of rules that are fundamentally abhorrent. And so this is the dilemma that was faced by CNN and everyone else in a place like the old Baghdad. So I said it was easy to say that East and Jordan and CNN made the wrong choice. It certainly allows for a comforting moral clarity, which we all seek in life. And it may be, in fact, that they did step over a line in pandering to Iraqi officials. Um, John Burns, who is our Baghdad bureau chief now, uh, and uh, is a wonderful and fascinating fellow, um, really, uh, in the six months up leading up to the war, he's been in Iraq now for about two and a half years. 
Um, he refused entirely to pander to the Iraqi officials. Uh, this meant that he was uh, threatened by death, uh, with death by the authorities. He had his equipment and his money stolen by government thugs. And at one point toward the end, uh, before the war began, he was hiding out in the room of an Italian uh, correspondent when things got very bad. And he has a somewhat different perspective from mine, and I wanted to read to you from um, a sort of oral testimony that he gave about uh, the final months of, uh, of the uh, Iraq before the, before the war. They interviewed, there was a, a project interviewing a bunch of correspondents. So he said, um, he said, without contest, I was the most closely watched and unfavored of all the correspondents there because of what I wrote about terror while Saddam was still in power. Actually, he said, whilst Saddam was suddenly was still in power, he's a Brit. Terror, totalitarian states, and their ways are nothing new to me, John said. But I felt from the start that this was in a category by itself, with the possible exception of the present world of North Korea. I felt that this was the central truth that has to be told about this place. It was also the essential truth that was untold by the vast majority of correspondents here. Why? because they judged that the only way they could keep themselves in play here was to pretend that it was okay. There were correspondents who thought it appropriate to seek the approbation of the people who governed their lives. This was the Ministry of Information, and particularly the director of the ministry. By taking him out for long candlelit dinners, plying him with sweet cakes, plying him with mobile phones at $600 each from members of his family, and giving bribes of thousands of dollars. Senior members of the information ministry took hundreds of thousands of dollars of bribes from these television correspondents who then behaved as if they were in Belgium. They never mentioned the function of minders. They never mentioned terror. This is still John talking. In one case, a correspondent actually went to the internet center at the Al Rashid Hotel and printed out copies of his and other people's stories, mine included, specifically in order to be able to show the difference between himself and the others. He wanted to show what a good boy he was, compared to this enemy of the state, and he was with a major American newspaper. It was an absolutely disgraceful performance. This is still John. CNN's Eason Jordan's op-ed piece in the New York Times missed that point completely. The point is not whether we protect the people who work for us by not disclosing the terrible things they tell us. Of course we do. But the people who work for us are only one thousandth of one percent of the people of Iraq. So why not tell the story of the other people of Iraq? It doesn't preclude you from telling about terror, of murder on a mass scale, just because you won't talk about how your driver's brother was murdered. Now left with the residue of all of this, I would say there are serious lessons to be learned. This is still John. Editors of great newspapers and small newspapers and editors of great television networks should exact from their correspondents the obligation of telling the truth about these places. It's not impossible to tell the truth. I have a conviction about closed societies that they're actually much easier to report on than they seem, because the act of closure is itself revealing. Every lie tells a truth. If you just leave your eyes and ears open, it's extremely revealing. So John, as I said, who's British and who just turned 60 a few months ago and has won two Pulitzers, one from Bosnia and one from Afghanistan, goes on to say that he's an individual with a conscience and that a paper can't and mustn't ask him to suspend that conscience when he's in the field. And how could anyone disagree with that? I certainly wouldn't disagree with it, but I would point out that as satisfying as it is to hear John speak, it's not as simple in the field. Um, and I think that, in fact, you're faced with very complex choices and very few answers. Um, I'll give you a simple example of covering violence. When I was working in Israel and a bomb went off in a cafe or a bus, I was aware of the event usually within, at most, an hour. Uh, I, would, I would be able to go to the place, uh, usually slip under a police line, look at the scene of the devastation, um, and then I would get to the hospital, uh, uh, see survivors, and within a few hours you could count on a senior minister, likely the prime minister, coming to give a press conference. And by the end of the day, you had an entire notebook full of stuff. Uh, and depending on how many people were killed, more than you needed for a story of that day. 
By contrast, uh, I remember in the mid-90s when I was based in the region and a bomb went off in Damascus, and how do we know? Because four weeks later, there was a four-paragraph story in the Financial Times saying diplomatic sources report that a bomb went off in a bus station in Damascus four weeks ago. And that's all you knew. You didn't know if it was political, and you didn't know anything about it. The same was true when Uday Hussein was uh, shot in Mansoor in the fancy section of Baghdad in the late 96. Yeah, you would, you couldn't, as soon as something like that would happen, you could never get a visa to that country. And um, whether Uday Hussein was in a white Mercedes or a red Jaguar, whether when he was with a girl or a boy or a party or coming from a party or going to one, you never knew. In fact, you didn't really know that he was shot except people were talking about it. Finally, Iraqi television showed him in a wheelchair being attended to by Cuban doctors, and so you understood that in fact he had been shot. But you did no way, no way of knowing if it was a political shooting, if it indicated anything was going on under the surface in Iraq, or whether one of the people he had abused simply took a shot at him. I tell you all this just to let you know that one of the biggest challenges of a news organization or of an individual reporter in the region of the Middle East is the question of balance and fairness, even in the amount of coverage that you give. As I say, in Israel, no visa is needed. Uh, it's, it's a very accessible place. Uh, the government press office hands out lists of phone numbers of every member of the parliament, or the Knesset as it's known, and the ministers of the government. There is a lively and probing local press, and the society is quite accustomed to, you might even say, obsessed with self-examination. By contrast, most Arab societies are really quite lacking in this culture of public information and public self-scrutiny. The kinds of questions that we in the Western media live on, changes in attitude, internal discord, are extremely hard to find or to discern without opinion polls, without call and radio shows, without an active press, and of course without free elections. In fact, I found, uh, I don't read Arabic very well, but through translators and translations, when you read the Arabic press, you'll find pages filled with very little about their own societies or their own politicians, but often, and this is really an odd irony when you're there, packed with news agency dispatchers about Israel. One of the most striking aspects of traveling between Jerusalem and Amman and Jordan, and it's a great exercise to do, you pick up the Jerusalem Post that morning, you go by road to the Allenby Bridge, and then you cross into Jordanian territory, and you take a, another taxi up to Amman, and you buy the Jordan Times. And you'll often find that they're relatively mirror images of each other, both of them speculating on what's going on in Israeli politics. And that's because they can't do it in their own politics. It's, it's a little, you know, it's become somewhat more relaxed in Jordan, but it is still um, pretty tightly controlled in terms of what can really be said. And then, you know, you have this odd thing. Uh, there are no Jews who live in Jordan. Uh, and so it really wouldn't be all that hard to imagine that if you grow up never having met a Jew, but all your, your papers are filled with stories about Jews, wondering if it, maybe it is true that the Jews run the world. Um, on the other hand, when you cover Israel as a foreign correspondent, there's also, despite all the self-examination that I've talked about, uh, and it is real and it is quite exciting to watch. In fact, it, it, if you're a correspondent in Israel, you can sort of turn on your radio in bed at 7 a.m. And if you listen to the newsreels from 7 to 9, you'll hear most ministers harangued by journalists on the radio. And you can sort of get your story that day without even getting out of bed. But at the same time, I have to tell you that um, it's a society that also doesn't ask certain questions of itself, and one of the functions of a foreign correspondent is to examine a place and ask, what is it not talking about? What are the assumptions that this society is making about itself and its neighbors, its enemies, and its friends that seem open to scrutiny that they don't seem to be scrutinizing? And, and one of the things, it seemed to me, was the question of how you define terror and terrorist and terrorism, which has become of course, um, sort of every other word that we say in America since September 2001. Um, it, was not, uh, it was not so uh, at that time that I was in the Middle East in terms of American coverage, but it was certainly a big deal in Israeli coverage. <coughs> Israel at that time was occupying the southern tenth of Lebanon uh, in order to prevent uh, guerrilla and militant and terrorist, if you like, infiltrations um, by anti-Israel groups. Um, and there were armed Israeli soldiers on the ground in, in Lebanon. 
And when a local Lebanese civilian attacked a fully armed Israeli soldier, every Israeli media news outlet, including the most liberal, call it terrorism. You ask yourself, it, terrorism may be many things, but is, is it, does the definition, can you stretch it to cover the attack of a foreign occupying soldier on your own land? It doesn't seem very likely, but that's the best word for it. In fact, we have found it to be very difficult to define when to use the word at the paper, and I, I would say that we have not really come to a, a proper solution. Uh, and since I joined the, the Foreign Desk as the deputy editor about a year ago, I've asked some of our correspondents to help me think about when it's appropriate to use the word, because we don't have a very clear rule about it. And one of them wrote me a wonderful note back. Uh, he is, he's a former Jerusalem correspondent, and I will read a little bit of it to you, uh, because it is, I think, very instructive. He said, for me, the problem with using the word terrorism was always where to stop rather than where to start. It's pretty easy to call certain egregious acts terrorism and have the whole world agree with you. It's when you draw a line and say a particular act does not qualify as terrorism that you commit what looks to the world like a political act and may in fact be one. It's very tempting not to use the word, the word at all. For some time in Jerusalem, he said, I avoided it altogether as too politically loaded for coverage of the conflict, particularly after September 11. My theory was that if I got to the scene of an attack and described it in the most vivid detail possible, I'd be doing readers the kind of service we aspire to provide, not guiding judgments with labels, but letting readers choose their own labels based on the facts. But that approach came to seem mistaken. It felt so morally neutral as to be a little sickening. The calculated bombing of students in a university cafeteria or of families gathered in an ice cream parlor, cries out to be called what it is. I wanted to avoid the political meaning that comes with terrorism, but I couldn't pretend that the word had no usage at all in plain English. And not to use the term began to seem to me like a political act, again, this is him writing, in itself, a statement by implication that I was not sure that anything did in fact qualify as terrorism, that all those horrors uh, could find a rationale, an explicable motive in politics. It was to endorse the Hamas view of the violence, as surely as to apply the word terrorist to every stone thrower would be to endorse the most extreme Israeli view. I also came to think that while we erode our credibility as truth tellers by making political judgments in our copy, we can also put that cred credibility at risk by ducking any moral judgments. It seemed to me that some perceived political taint in the language was inevitable. The goal is not to minimize it, using the term when it had broad factual and moral basis, and when not using it made a sharper, stronger political statement than using it. And of course, I tried to continue describing attacks as powerfully as I could, from interviews and as much direct witnessing as possible. Broadly speaking, he said, I think terrorism is the deliberate use of deadly violence against civilians for political purposes. That strikes me as a good definition. And then he said, as applied to Israel and the occupied territories, my rough rule, not written down or rigidly adhered to, was to call Palestinian attacks on civilians within the boundaries of 1948, is, uh, 1948 Israel terrorism. I did not go out of my way to use the word, but I didn't shy away from it when it served a descriptive purpose. For example, it was the first terrorist attack in Tel Aviv in such and such number of days. Rather than use the word terrorist, I tried to use words that carry more specific weight, gunman, bomber, but sometimes I did use terrorist. I believed and believe that this 1948-1967 distinction did not imply that, that the Times necessarily accepted the Palestinian view that Israelis in the West Bank and Gaza are occupiers and therefore legitimate targets, but it did indicate that the Times recognized that that definition had broad legitimacy in the world and that to challenge it, in our paper, by calling violence in the West Bank or Gaza terrorism, would be to take a clear political position. Then he asks, what do you do when a gunman infiltrates a settlement in the West Bank and kills a five-year-old girl in her bed, leaving a bullet hole in her Mickey Mouse pillowcase? I didn't use the word terrorism. All I could do was default to my first approach and describe the attack and the victims as vividly as I could. 
There are intentional acts of deadly violence against Palestinian civilians, he says, by Israelis who are not under government orders but are pursuing a political agenda, attacked by settlers, and there the word terrorism clearly applies. I may be chickening out here, he wrote to me, but I'm, sh I'm not sure it's a bad thing that we don't have an engraved standard for the use of the word terrorism. It used to bother me that we didn't, but I came to think that some ambiguity on the question was constructive. Having a clear rule might create a straitjacket or a phony standard by which readers will judge us every time we don't use the word. One of the things that I found when I was overseas, and that I think that overseas correspondents feel constantly, is the need to tell your readers at home two contradictory things. The first one is that the people here that you're, I'm here observing and writing about, they may look and sound strange, they may talk an odd language, but they are really no different from you and me. They want security and dignity, they want a better life for their children, and while what, while, what you share with them far outweighs any differences. The second message is the opposite. Yes, the people here eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yes, they hurt and they love. Yes, they like action movies. But if you think that by knowing those basic human details about these people that you understand them, you're badly mistaken because these people are very different from you and me. And in my years of reporting for the Middle East, I found myself whipsawed between these two perspectives and never more so than on the reporting trips I took to Iraq in the 1990s. As I said earlier, political freedom in that society was such a foreign concept that most Iraqis had no context in which to even thirst for it. At least that was my impression. The contours of debate, the language, uh, were so narrow that there was no meaningful way for people to discuss alternative political models. And I came to feel the language of Iraqi politics had been so degraded that there was just no framework for opposition, let alone what might have been imagined as an alternative. And that's why, in trying to understand the American effort to uh, change Iraqi society, um, it has, I've always been um, impressed and skeptical at once, because it seemed to me uh, a, a monumental task. It doesn't mean it's not worth trying. It doesn't mean that it's not a noble endeavor. But it, it does mean, and the analogy that I've drawn to myself sometimes is, if you had an, an abused child all his life and then put him in a position of parenthood and said, go for it, you can imagine why it might not be such an easy task. Now, you heard that I spent a couple of years on the editorial page, and I wanted to spend a, 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 a few minutes on that, and the distinction between that and uh, news, and, and then we'll have questions. Um, I was talking to your student newspaper editors here earlier, and um, found that the editor of the newspaper is also in charge of the opinion section. And this is not at all uncommon, but it is not the case of the Times. Now, um, originally, actually, American newspapers are almost nothing but editorials with a little bit of shipping news thrown in here and there. A lot of the so-called news reports were really in the category of rumor. We're talking about colonial American newspapers. There was one colonial era column in a paper whose headline I've always been very fond of. It was called, Important If True. <laughs> Political endorsements often masqueraded as news in those days. Uh, there's a, a now defunct Chicago Daily newspaper, for example, which had two subheads about two Indiana politicians with presidential ambitions, one named Oliver Morton and the other named Thomas Hendricks. And the headlines read as follows. I think you can guess which one the paper favored. Hendricks, a man of the purest social relations. Morton, a foe to society, a seducer, and a libertine. <laughs> It wasn't really until the middle of the 20th century that American newspapers, at least as major ones, cleanly separated objective reporting from editorials, and there are a lot of reasons for that evolution. Clearly, one reason is that readers were becoming more sophisticated, uh, and, more, and journalists were becoming more professional. But um, another, another theory, I think, has to do with economics. That is to say, uh, advertising took over as the main source of income for newspapers. And objective reporting, a short advertisers that what was uh, next to their ads was not likely to offend anyone the way uh, in political endorsements might have. Today at the Times, as at several of the largest uh, papers in the United States, there is, as I say, a complete separation of news and opinion. We can discuss, if you want, later whether it is a totally effective one. But there's certainly a complete separation uh, and the functions of the two uh, departments. Mm -hmm. 
There is no single editor for both. Okay, the executive editor of the New York Times, a man named Bill Keller, uh, is in charge of 110,000 words a day, and the other five or 10,000 that appear on the editorial page and the op-ed page, he has nothing to do with. Uh, those are handled by a woman named Gail Collins, who's the editorial page editor. She answers directly to the publisher, and so does Bill Keller. The editorial board at the Times is made up of about 15 people who gather around a table three times a week uh, to discuss what positions to take from the position of that page. Okay, what does this page believe? Uh, uh, and, the pa and the page refers to itself as a page rather than as a newspaper. You may read in the New York Times editorial page, this, this newspaper believes. It will say this page believes. And that's an effort to make clear the distinction between the people who sit around that table and the people who are seven floors below them working on the news. In some ways, you might ask, well, if there's been this evolution away from editorial uh, toward more objectivity, uh, is, are editorials really necessary any longer? Maybe they're just a relic from an earlier era, and sometimes when the Times gets hammered uh, from the right as being a, a tool of the left, I must say I, I ask myself the same question. I, I was not a particularly comfortable editorial writer and happily returned to news after a two-year stint. Um, but the argument of those who write the opinion page in favor of its continued viability and importance is that if you have an institution in town like a newspaper, the most wired institution after all, that really is somehow a responsibility to raise its voice about what it sees to be as wrongdoing. That it's essential to its role in the community, as is its endorsement of political candidates. There's another role that you could um, see for the editorial page, and that is, in a way, as a kind of guidance for the rest of the journalists of the newspaper to say, this is what you don't do. When you write, uh, you might want to slip in your views or opinions, but the existence of the editorial page tells you these are this is where this goes on and not over there. So that's that I didn't find it particularly easy to be an editorial writer. I had spent my entire life in a kind of step back position, and I'm I'm happier in that role and happier to have returned to it. Um, and I, I had a, a funny example of it in the book that was mentioned that I wrote uh, about 15 years ago about Robert Bork. Um, one of the chapters was about the fact that uh, liberal groups had um, really smeared him. Um, I mean, the book was not an actually a pro board book. The book was a look at what had happened. But one of the things that uh, I found in my reporting was that, um, irrespective of what you thought of his uh, judicial opinions, and by the way, personally, I wasn't very fond of them, um, the liberals who went after him did so in what I felt to be a somewhat underhanded way. That is to say, they were happy to allow uh, black churches in the South to spread the word that he was an atheist. In fact, he was quite a religious man. Uh, they, were, uh, they were allowed distortions of certain of his opinions to make it sound like he favored uh, sterilization of women workers, and so on. And when I wrote the book and, uh, as it were, exposed some of these things, the groups were extremely angry at me, um, these advocacy groups, and I felt that I had betrayed them. And I didn't really mind, because although, as I said, I, I, did, I didn't really disagree with their objective, I, I felt it important to expose the way they had gone about doing it. Um, and then when I found myself on the editorial page covering judicial appointments, suddenly we were all the best of friends, because here we were on the same side of almost all the nominations, and I found it, um, I found it rather uncomfortable, frankly. Um, Okay, I think that looking at the time, I'm going to skip the next couple of pages uh, because I think we only have a half an hour left and some of you in five or so minutes may want to leave for a class, if I understand correctly. So uh, there is already a raised hand. I couldn't be happier. All right, I, have I, think, that, I think you're supposed to hold up a microphone. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, First one is uh, you were talking a lot about how the Middle East has um, a lot of uh, control and censorship over what um, foreign correspondents can talk about, and can cover, and what the um, what the consequences of uh, what they write or what they report is. Um, yet you neglected to talk about how Al Jazeera's office was closed down for a month by the Coalition Provisional Authority. We're talking about insurgency. Um, you neglected to uh, talk about a lot of, uh, uh, like the uh, reporter that reported the uh, guy
guy that was killed in the mosque in Fallujah um, at, at Point Blank, how he was treated by the media and how he was called a traitor here. Um, so I was just, um, uh, you know, a lot of times you go to bloggers and you see um, clips of U.S. soldiers talking about how fun it's to kill Iraqis and to kill insurgents, yet none of that appears in the mainstream media. Um, my question is, what's your opinion of the ethical dilemmas of reporting what our soldiers and our people are doing there, and why that doesn't make it mainstream media? My second question is... Um, well, you know what, let me take it. Unless it's related, I'll forget your first question. Okay. okay? Uh, I think that um, yeah, I mean I think that's a fair point. Um, I don't I, I don't think it's quite right that I neglected to talk about it. I, mean, I was talking about these things, but it's a very good question because in wartime, uh, covering your own soldiers is um, is a great ethical challenge. In fact, um, the uh, Abu Ghraib prison um, uh, scandal of last year. Um, has posed a lot of difficulties, I think, for um, the media. Um, we consider it our sacred duty to cover abuses by American soldiers and the behavior of American soldiers. Sacred duty. Uh, and I would say that the Times must have published 50, 60 articles about Abu Ghraib, about uh, abuse of uh, prisoners in uh, Afghanistan as well. In fact, uh, uh, our reporter in Afghanistan, Carlotta Gaul, is um, has really been out front in the Afghan abuse coverage. She's really been very, very dogged about it. Um, and uh, I think that you are right. It's a it's a delicate topic. It's a delicate topic for uh, the fact that uh, these soldiers are our countrymen and their families live among us. And always, when you write about the difficulties of war, uh, you feel like. Um, you constantly sort of hear this echo in your mind about, well, in previous wars, there were no cameras, there was no one to watch, and nobody complained. War is a nasty business. Is this really an appropriate thing to be exposing its nastiness and thereby implicitly questioning its function and its role? Uh, and are you, are, are, so, and so the bloggers, then various bloggers will accuse the Times of having an agenda, which would be to sort of turn the public's um, views against the war. We really, really don't see it that way. Um, and try very hard, in fact, every day to come to work and say, how did it go today in Iraq? What's happening? Uh, is the war uh, successful on its own terms, rather than on any terms we might impose of our own? And how are our soldiers behaving? And what's it like for them? And, and if, in fact, they are um, engaging in abuse, are there hires up who have urged them to, who have treated them in a way, who created the conditions for it? These are difficult judgments that end up being moral judgments, but I think um, they're central to what we do. What's your second question? Uh, my second question is, uh, you were talking about Israel and how free your press is and how it was a lot easier for you guys. Um, if, I think you also know that uh, the Arabic media there, the Palestinian-produced media, um, undergoes daily censorship that they have to submit a rough draft every night uh, to the Israelis to be approved to print the next morning. Um, I think you guys were subjected to that in the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, but are you guys still subject to that in Israel? Um, it's not a question, but it's not wrong. I mean, what you say is, and in fact, in theory, all newspapers in Israel, not so much the foreign, but the, the daily, do in theory have some censorship they need to go through. Um, and that's true. It turns out to be not a very effective censorship, um, and that a lot does come out, and the, the, the system has broken down enormously in the last 15 or 20 years. But you're right, it's not without its official censorship. Uh, I would say to you, though, that it is a, re a remarkably active press on the Arab as well as the Israeli side, not the Palestinian press within the Palestinian Authority so much, because that's got its own set of complications. But um, I appreciate your footnotes to my point. They're quite right. You want me to pick the, or you want to? You go ahead. You're the guy with the mic. You, you pick the question. <laughs> one, one thing I seem to notice is that there are, uh, Maybe something the public wants, but there seems to be a tendency 
on the part of the media to want to project what's going to happen next, to forecast what's going to happen next. Uh, and then you wonder how much of the reporting has gone to justify the predictions of what was going to happen next that may or may not have come true. How do you deal with that? <clears throat> I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting criticism. Uh, I, I don't think you're wrong. I think that there is a feeling. Um, we talk on, on the desk about uh, projecting the story forward. Where's it going? All right. How do we help readers think about where the, what, where the story is going? Now, in theory, of course, you can't report the future. So in that sense, doing so seems to be a failure. On the other hand, um, you know, if, um, we can stay with Iraq for the moment, if, for example, you're reporting out how the coalition in the Iraqi politics after the election is going to shake out, it's, it's like, you know, who's going to be the next, is, is, will Howard Dean become the head of the DNC? It's what we do. I mean, you go talk to people, you say, well, are you going to vote for him, you know, for him, who's, what's going on, with, you know, and then you end up writing a story saying, um, things look good for Howard Dean, and if he doesn't come through, you look like an idiot, but if he does come through, they'd be like, well, you know, big deal. They, it was obvious. So there is sort of a problem. Um, on the other hand, it, it, it is, properly speaking, the function of the, I think, of a journalist to try to throw the story forward, but not irresponsibly. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Right here. Mr. Bronner, um, what limitations do the journalists face out there embedded in military units? And is it more free now that they're embedded with military units, or are they more limited? Um, it's a, a, a central issue for us, and it's a great question. Um, the limitations vary from unit to unit, and sort of uh, there's no official doctrine about what it is you can and can't do. Um, there is always the risk that you will annoy someone and not be invited back. And so in that sense, you're at some mercy that you wouldn't be if you're an independently operating reporter. Um, and we have had a number of experiences where uh, our reporter has reported something and it seemed embarrassing to a commander and he said, you know, I, I agree to talk to him off the record and, that, and he's never coming back here again and, you know, we say that, that that's not true, that was on, you know, obviously differences in perception and various arguments occur with Pentagon officials. Um, at the moment, because Iraq is such a difficult place for uh, non-Arabs to work because of the fear of violence and of kidnapping, the fact that we, our reporters, can embed in military units is actually a great help to us. It allows us to get to the different parts of the country. Uh, and then sometimes they quote unquote disembed for a period of time and then re-embed. And there have been plenty of disputes about that too. I would say that um, we have not been unhappy with how we've been treated. I think that the military has tried. Um, when commanders have gotten the notion in their head that a particular reporter is hostile or difficult or unpleasant, appropriately or inappropriately, it has caused us problems. But overall, it has been, at the moment, more useful than not, given how dangerous the country has been. Um, I was just interested in your opinion on Al Jazeera. I've been watching a few documentaries about it, specifically about the a couple of things like that. Do you do you feel how do you feel about the reporting? Well, I'm going to duck the question just a little bit, a little bit like the CNN question, as to say, what do I think of CNN's reporting in, in Iraq over those years? I don't really know without a proper examination. And I don't watch Al Jazeera regularly. I don't know Arabic well enough. I don't get it. Uh, but like you, I've seen the control room, and I'm certainly aware uh, of Al Jazeera. Um, and I'm broadly, I'm delighted that it exists. I think it's um, very helpful in the Arab world that there is uh, essentially independent television network. Now there's a lot of media as well, uh, and there are others that are coming online. Um, you know, I would say that uh, the from my impressions are that the reporting is quite mixed in terms of its quality and objectivity. Um, it, it seems to be more um, a network looking to build an argument rather than, you know, daily trying to sort of tell us what's going on. They, 
they certainly, un I don't, until the recent uh, breakthrough in Israeli Palestinian negotiations, they tended to run loops of Israeli um, violence against Palestinians on the TV over and over and over and over again. <laughs> Um, and American uh, uh, violence in Iraq over and over again, so that it seemed that the, um, it was sort of feeding uh, an anger that was out there, rather than coolly, objective, objectively reporting or trying to. Those are difficult tasks. So I have a, a mixed view of it. I, thank you, first of all, for your presentation. It's been very good. Uh, could you briefly explain, or perhaps summarize, the contention between conservatives and mainstream media? Where did that start? Where are we at, and where do you see that heading? On one foot, as the rabbis say, right? Um, I don't know a lot about where it started. Um, I haven't done a study of it, and it would be a great topic. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, and one that engages me a lot. We get um, that this phrase, mainstream media, seems to have appeared in the last year or so, perhaps longer but not much, uh, now shortened to MSM, and refer to us and uh, you know, the other obvious candidates. And the, the accusation is uh, that we are, I mean, there are two kinds of accusation. One is that we are consciously seeking to embarrass the Republican administration or um, uh, impose a liberal set of uh, principles uh, on the country. And the other, a somewhat subtler argument, is that we are so uh, focused on our own navels that we don't even know we're doing this, but that in effect, without consciously trying to, we are uh, so uh, persuaded of the need of uh, of, of our perspective that we simply constantly reimpose it over the events. Um, I, I, again, I don't know a lot about the history of it. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I can tell you that I don't think it's a fair criticism of us. Um, I do welcome uh, critiques of our coverage all the time. And I'm in correspondence with people constantly, officials and ordinary individuals who send complaints about our usage of language, our failure to, uh, you know, if we're going to, if there's a story about one thing to fail to acknowledge, if there's something similar going on on a competing side, that sort of thing. And um, we run corrections and we run editor's notes when we feel we've really failed. Um, I think that in the broadest philosophical way of using the word liberalism, um, we probably are guilty of liberalism in the sense that we, uh, most people who work at the newspaper uh, and similar organizations are not very religious, do not, um, are skeptical of all received truths, and believe that constantly questioning everything you're told is a good thing. And I think that that you know, creates, it, it creates a, a wide range of reactions. Um, I think that if you look at the Times' coverage of the Clinton administration, you'd find it to have been, you could almost say vicious. I mean, it was certainly very, very tough. Uh, Whitewater, uh, the scandal of Whitewater, real or not, was, uh, came from the New York Times. Um, and certainly everything about uh, the Lewinsky scandal, both on the editorial page and uh, in the news coverage, was front and center. But I think that um, conservatives who are angry at the New York Times for its coverage of the Bush administration don't see the, don't understand that, or to them it's so obvious that Clinton was evil that, well, what do you expect them to do? You know what I mean? Sort of. Um, and so this is the problem. I think that today, where we have such a, a Republican dominated government, um, and the, the newspaper sees itself as having the role of questioning authority, it seems like it's questioning Republican principles rather than simply questioning the authority that's in power. Um, but as I say, I do think that uh, because most reporters and editors uh, don't share a religious perspective, there, there is likely to be some conflict between um, the, the conservative movement as it defines itself in this country uh, and the newspapers. But I don't think it's typically the way they portray it. It's a long conversation. I, I just feel, I mean, it, and it's a great topic, and we can come back to it, but I just feel like there are other people with questions.